So last week, Pastor David began this series called Irresistible, and I'm going to continue it today. And last week, he shared with us that this series is about the qualities of God that when made known, make him irresistible. So we're going to continue with that today, and today the quality that we're going to be talking about is the second quality, which is the quality of love, God's love. So we're going to talk about the irresistible love of God today. We all know that the greatest love story ever told is the love story in the Bible of Jesus laying down his life for a sin-sick world, right? But I believe, in my personal opinion, I think one of the second greatest love stories there is in the Bible is the story of Hosea. And you may think that that seems a little odd, but I'm gonna, we're going to talk about that this morning, and then maybe you'll understand. Every girl likes a good love story now and then, right? Pastor David will sit through them with me occasionally, you know, just to just be a good husband. But us girls, we enjoy it. Well, this is a story that is really amazing. So I'm going to begin just by telling you a little bit of the story before we get into the word. And the Bible gives just the basic information about what transpired. So allow me, if you will, to kind of embellish the story a little bit as to how I believe it it could have gone. So in the book of Hosea, we see that Hosea was an unmarried prophet. He was an unmarried prophet. Uh, a, a preacher, really, um, really a prophet, if you, if you want to get down to it. He lived during Old Testament times, and it was a time when God's people had turned their back on God, and the Israelites at this time, they were more interested in worshiping idols than they were in, in interested in worshiping God. If you read the Old Testament at all, if you study the Bible, you see that this is kind of a habitual thing. God's people were constantly getting distracted from him turning their back on him. Well, this was one of those eras when God raised up Hosea to be a prophet to them. Well, God decided that he was going to use the life of Hosea uh, to preach one of the most powerful illustrated sermons that you would, could ever imagine. And this would be a sermon that would illustrate to God's people how unfaithful they had been to him, but how that even through their unfaithfulness that God was going to redeem them back to himself. So as our story starts, one day God told Hosea that his bachelor days were up. Okay? Must have been hard to be an unmarried prophet in that time. I don't know. Or maybe that was typical. But God spoke to him and said, okay, Hosea, you're done. It's time for you to take a wife. And I'm sure that up to this point in time, you know, he had envisioned, you know, what his wife would be like. He probably had scoured all the local Bible colleges and thought, well, you know, everybody here is Jewish. They're all dark haired, but maybe I'll find me a little blonde, you know, somebody who can play the piano and sing and lead in worship and kind of just add to my ministry, you know. So I'm sure this is kind of what he had in mind. But one day God said to Hosea, okay, it's time. I have the woman for you. The problem with the wedding announcement was that it came with a dreadful prophecy. God told Hosea that he was going to marry a prostitute and that his wife would break his heart that she would even give birth to children who were not his. Now, can you imagine how he must have felt just dashing all of his dreams of finding that perfect right woman that would asset his ministry? But Hosea humbled himself in obedience to the Lord, and he married a woman by the name of Gomer, being fully aware of her tainted reputation. And she had one, let me tell you. I'm sure, you know, that Even though he did this in obedience to the Lord, I'm sure that he held out hope that maybe he could change her. You know, maybe he could change her with his love. Maybe, you know, God could get a hold of her and that soon she would get over that restlessness that she was displaying immediately when they got married. Well, soon after they were married, she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Maybe now she would be a mother. Maybe now that she was a mother, she would, it would change her heart. Maybe now she would settle down. That nurturing would start, uh, you know, just slipping in. You know how it is, moms. When you become a mom, something just kind of clicks inside of you, and you just, all of a sudden, you just, 
begin to change. You just want to mother and nurture. And I'm sure he thought maybe that is exactly what's going to happen to her. So he held out hope. Surely now she'll settle down and those mothering instincts will take hold. But it wasn't long before Hosea began to hear rumors. Rumors of her slipping off during the day when he was not around. Rumors of her being seen with other men. Then, all of a sudden, she becomes pregnant again with a child that Hosea knows he is sure could not be his. She gives birth to a little girl, and Hosea names the daughter Lo-Ruhama, meaning not loved. Gomer's unfaithfulness continues, and soon afterwards, another child is born. Hosea names this child Lo-Ami, which means not my people. He knew that these children were not his. So here we find Hosea. He had been obedient to God. He had held out hope that maybe something would happen. But here he is. He's a brokenhearted father, a betrayed husband, a bewildered preacher. You know, because that kind of word that he's giving out is not readily accepted. And so I'm sure he felt like his fragile heart would never recover with all of these losses that he was experiencing in his life. And then comes the final blow. Gomer's wanderings had drawn her into the wrong company. And she ends up leaving her husband and her three children for another man. Probably a man who offers her all of the things that the world has to offer. You know, Hosea lived a pretty simple life, pretty calm life, where Hosea stood for righteousness and integrity. This man offers her fame and fortune and pleasure and all those things that she had wanted because God had still not gotten a hold of her heart. But we all know that the pleasures of sin only last for a season, right? So after a while, her prince Charming loses interest in her, and he moves on to greener pasture. And Gomer finds herself alone, going back to the old lifestyle of selling herself for money. And this is where she's at. And she's beginning, at this time, Gomer's beginning to look a little older. You know, her, she's had three children. She's losing her youthful figure. She's lost that sparkle in her eyes that she used to have. She doesn't have the stamina that she has anymore to keep up this kind of a lifestyle. And business is beginning to dwindle. I believe she starts thinking back about that husband and those three children that she left. And I believe she maybe even thinks and remembers those words that Hosea spoke to her over and over again about God and about the love of God. And it begins to haunt her. And even though she begins to long for home and her husband and her children, she just can't return. She lacks the courage to return to them. She's too full of shame and remorse for what she's done. So with no way left to support herself, she makes the decision to sell herself into slavery to cover the debts that she had incurred. And about this time, God tells Hosea to do the unthinkable. He says, Hosea, I want you to go redeem your wife. So we're going to pick up on the scripture at this point. This is on verse 3. Then the Lord said to me, Go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. So I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. Then I said to her, you must live in my house for many days and stop your prostitution. During this time, you will not have sexual relations with anyone, not even with me. Now, can you imagine how he must have felt when God told him to go buy her back? This woman has gone completely against everything that Hosea stood for. He preached and practiced righteousness. She lived in the most unrighteous way you can imagine. He preached and lived faithfulness. She was one of the most unfaithful people that he knew. And not only did God instruct him to go by her back, but he instructed him to love her. He instructed him to love her. That would be almost impossible. It would be impossible in the human human being, right? It would take the love of God. Imagine how Gomer felt 
when she sees Hosea on the, in the crowd. Okay, she's standing up on the auction block in all of her shame, in, in, in all of her dirt, in her filth. She's not even had the money to take care of herself. She's standing there, and all of a sudden, as she has the courage to lift up her head, she looks out, and she sees these familiar pair of eyes, these eyes that she knew so well a few years back. And I can only imagine how she must have felt, the shame she must have felt when her eyes lock with his. Then he steps up, and he gives not just every dime he has, but he also has to throw in five bushels of barley, which was his livelihood that he had worked for to feed his family, and a measure of wine. That would tell me that maybe he was outbidding someone else, or maybe the price was a little bit higher than what he had expected, or maybe he just didn't have that much money. So he had to throw in everything that he had just to buy her back. Now, can you imagine their ride home? Think about it. I believe it went something like this. Her head is hung low because I don't even think she can look at him. She's so ashamed. She can't look into his eyes, and she must be sitting there wondering, okay, what does he want with me? There has to be an ulterior motive because she doesn't understand the love of God at this point. He must plan to beat me or starve me, make me pay for what I did to him and to those children. He's probably just wants from me over and over again what other men have taken from me, which is my body. All these thoughts have to be swirling around in her mind as they're making their way home. So they walk into the house, and he turns to her. She still has her head down because she can't look at him. And he says, Gomer, look at me. Look at me. And this is what he says to her. We just read it. You will spend the rest of your life here with me. You don't have to lie with me or have sexual relations with me for quite some time. But you're still going to live here. And I'm going to provide for you for the rest of your life. And if that wasn't enough, he says, oh, and by the way, here are your children. And I've changed their names. I've changed their names. Lo Ruhama is now Ruhama, meaning loved. And lo, Ami is now called Ami, meaning my people. The Bible doesn't tell us Gomer's reaction to this, but I would imagine that as Hosea speaks these words to her and she looks into his eyes, that she suddenly sees a love that she's been searching for all of her life, that she suddenly sees the love of God in a way that she's never seen it before, a love of God that is completely irresistible to her completely irresistible to her. And this is the way God loves us, church. Homer was, uh, uh, Hosea was a faithful husband. Gomer was an unfaithful wife. God is the faithful lover of our souls. And we are often faithless and we're prone to wander and we're prone to go here and there, but he's faithful. And even though Hosea and Gomer's story is the story of God in Israel, it is also our story, church. When we, like Gomer, were, were, were running from God and were enslaved, God brought us back. When we found ourselves stuck in chains, we'd never dreamed we'd be stuck in chains of insecurity security, discontentment, fear, chains of sin. God came in and he freed us. When we by our very nature threw God's love away, he came in and he redeemed us. He came in and he redeemed us. This is our love story. Let's finish the last two verses that we begin reading. Verse four, it says, Israel will go a long time without a king or prince and without sacrifices sacred pillars, priests, or even idols. But afterward, but afterward, the people will return and devote themselves to the Lord their God and to David's descendant, their king. In the last days, they will tremble in awe of the Lord and of his goodness. In the five verses comprising Hosea 3, the irresistible love of God is described and demonstrated in four different ways that we're going to talk about real quickly. The first way that we see God's love described in this passage of Scripture is God's seeking love. 
God's seeking love. Throughout the Old Testament era, God's people had placed a confining limitation on God's love. It was the only love of God that they understood. They believed that God's mercy and love were limited to those who feared him and to those who remembered his commandments. In other words, to those who did the right thing. God's mercy for those who merited it, worked for it, right? This is how they believed. But when Jesus came, he redefined love. In verse one, God was showing Hosea and commanding him to demonstrate a revolutionary concept of the love of God that had never been known to Christians before. Love for those who are not worthy of it. Love for those who are not worthy of it. God was revealing the love of his new covenant that was to come in the New Testament. A love that seeks all people regardless of their moral, social, or spiritual condition. Romans chapter 5 verse 6 says this. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came and just at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, no one is likely to die for a good person, though someone might be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Hebrews 9.15 says this, That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. doesn't matter about their background. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under that first covenant. It is the irresistible love of God that seeks out sinful people. And we're talking about this new covenant love that came into being when Jesus died. He said, I'm going to change things. I'm going to wreck the way people look at this. I'm going to seek out sinful people. I'm not just going to love those people who have done what's right and those people who have followed my commandments, but I'm going to reach down into the gutter and I'm going to pick up the prostitute. I'm going to go into the prison and I'm going to love those ones that have killed and have destroyed other lives. And this was the new covenant love that God was talking about. The second example we see is God's redeeming love. His redeeming love. Hosea spent over and above the money he had to buy her back. (laughs) And when Hosea bought Gomer back from the slave market, a woman who had defiled herself in prostitution, I believe he saw her in a way he had never seen her before. I believe he saw her through the eyes of God all of a sudden. This was the only way that he could have followed what God said when God said, Go get your wife back and love her. The only way he could have done it was through the spirit of the Lord working in him. And so I believe at this moment that he brought her home, all of a sudden he began to even look at her differently. He saw her through the eyes of God and he began to love her in her sin no matter what she had done. Not only did he redeem her, but he renamed her children. Can you imagine? Many of us today think our past is unredeemable. We think I did this years ago and I'll never be forgiven. I can't forget it. I can't get over it. We can't can't get over our mistakes. We keep asking God for forgiveness. We go to God and we repent. We say, oh God, forgive me of that sin. And he does immediately. But then the accuser of the brethren and our flesh comes up and we start feeling guilty and we go and ask God again for forgiveness. And you know what he says? He says, for what? He says, for what? Because he doesn't even remember it anymore. We think because we have all of this evidence following us around of our past sins and our past mistakes that God can't forgive us. But God will turn the evidence of your past into blessings, just like he did those little children that he renamed. He said, yeah, this is what you did in sin. And it may have looked bad and it may have felt bad and it may have been bad. But hey, I'm going to break that curse. I'm going to rename those children and those children are going to be loved and they're going to be raised up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And they're going to be called mine. They're going to be called mine. God will turn the evidence of your past into blessings. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that just makes me so happy. <laughs> Hebrews 1, 7 says this. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. And unlike us, church, when he forgives, he forgets. Yeah. 
How many times have people come to you and asked for forgiveness and you say, oh, I forgive you. And then the next day you start thinking about what they did all over again, right? Well, geez, I can't believe they did that to me. And all of a sudden there's a distance between your relationship because you have not forgotten. But the thing about God is not only does he forgive, but in the instant he forgives, it's gone. It is wiped away. Look at what he says in Micah chapter 7, verse 19. This is the Message Bible, and I love what this says. Where is the God who can compare with you? Wiping the slate clean of guilt. Turning a blind eye, a deaf ear to the past sins of your purged and precious people. Your purged and precious people, even though they were sinful before. You don't nurse your anger and you don't stay angry long. For mercy is your specialty. Ha, huh, don't you love that? For mercy is your specialty. That's what you love most. He loves to be merciful to his children. And compassion is on its way to us. You'll stamp out our wrongdoing. You'll sink our sins to the bottom of the ocean, never to be remembered against us again. Isaiah 44, 2 says this, I have swept away your sins like a cloud. I have scattered your offenses like the morning mist. Oh, return to me, for I have paid the price to set you free. Not only does God buy us back, but he forgets our sins. That's the awesome thing about God. He does the complete work. He does it all. He forgets it all. The third way we see God's irresistible love demonstrated is that it is an everlasting love. It is an everlasting love. Hosea's willingness to give Gomer a home and family for the rest of her life is a reflection of God's everlasting love for us. Psalm 111 says he has paid a full ransom for his people. He has guaranteed his covenant with them forever, forever. What a holy, awesome, awe-inspiring name he has. Can I just tell you something, church? God does not believe in one night stands. When he commits to a relationship with you, he's in it for the long haul. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. We're living in a society where we don't see it today. People come and go out of relationships. You know, I've, I've counseled women that even they'll, they'll leave their husband because they, they, they believe they made a mistake and, and they got out of God's will. So I'm just going to leave. I'll start over again. Let me tell you something. You made a mistake, but once you took a covenant with that man, he was the one God had for you. And God expects you to live in faith and work on that marriage as long as that man is willing to do that. God doesn't believe in a one-night stand. He doesn't believe in a temporary relationship. He says, I am a God of covenant. I believe in covenant relationships. And I'm making a covenant with you that's going to last forever and ever. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm going to be with you always. Amen. Psalm 130 says, Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. The final piece to God's irresistible love that we see is his triumphant love. His triumphant love. Amen. That final verse says, But afterward the people will return and devote themselves to the Lord their God and to David's descendant, their king. In the last days, they're going to tremble in awe of the Lord and of his goodness. God's irresistible love conquers all. It conquers all. He says, but afterward, but afterward, in the end, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be so good to you that you're never going to want to leave me, that you're going to tremble in awe at my goodness. You're going to tremble in awe at the blessings that I have stored up for you. You're not even going to be able to contain them. You see, God always has the last word. He always has the last word. His last word is love, not wrath. Grace, not judgment. Return, not exile. That's what makes him so irresistible. That's what makes him so irresistible. Second Corinthians 2 says this, but thank God he has made us his captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. Now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. How does he hold us captive? We're held captive by his irresistible love. 
He loves us in a way that we can't resist him. We don't want to go anywhere else once we really get a taste of that irresistible love. I would love to tell you, church, that I have always understood this irresistible love of God, but I haven't. I was saved. I was a Christian. But I had a time in my life, years, when I didn't understand the irresistible love I just, I just didn't get it. You see, as most of you know, I was raised, you know, in old-time Pentecost, and there was a lot of law. There wasn't a whole lot of grace in the churches that we ministered in. And I was what you would call a good girl, okay? I never did anything in the world. I kept myself pure. I didn't, I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I didn't, I didn't dabble in anything. I, I mean, I was terrified. I thought that God would strike me with lightning, you know, if I, if I messed up or made a mistake. I was kind of raised in that era, you know, that old-time Pentecost. So I was a good girl. At the age of 24, I met David Freck. And it was lust at first sight. <laughs> Yes, you heard me right. It was lust at first sight. Not love, lust. I liked the way he walked. He walked with intention, with a heavy foot, like he was in command and he was in charge. I loved the way... (laughs) I loved the way he smelled. I loved the feeling of his leather jacket when he would hug me. I loved his deep blue eyes. You see, I had prayed for years for Mr. Wright, probably like Hosea did. I had prayed for years for that right mate. And here's what I told God. I said, God, I want somebody fair. I want somebody over six feet tall. I want somebody with blue eyes, and I want his name to be David. I'm telling you, you got to get specific with your prayers, people. you got to get specific with your prayers. <clears throat> So as we met, and and I was smitten and in lust for him, because I really didn't know him well enough to love him yet, we began to get to know each other, and our relationship began to grow. And I began to love him. He had all the qualities that I had asked God for, except for one thing. And there was one thing that really bothered me, and that was he had a past. Where I had been a good girl, he had not been a good boy. (laughs) and I say that mildly he had done all the things that I never would have done and I was struggling with that I was like God I have saved myself for 24 years and this is what you bring me he's almost perfect almost perfect except for that biggest thing he has a past, God. And I, I really believed you'd bring me somebody like me who did not have a past of sin. And I really struggled with that. And then, of course, you know, all the other boys in the Bible college that didn't want me to marry David, they kind of wanted to marry me. You know, they started going to my parents and spreading rumors. You know, this guy has a past, don't you? We know the kind of girl Tracy is. You know, she's kept herself all these years. And this guy, he's been bad news. You don't want to see your daughter end up with somebody like that. You know, and, and the gossip mill started churning. And it started bothering me more and more. But yet, I believed he was the one God had for me, and I loved him. So I said, I'm going to just talk to him about it. We're just going to, I'm just going to sit down and just bear my heart. So he came over one day, and we sat, and we were talking. And I said, you know, I, I know you love me. I love you. You've asked me to marry you, and I've said I will. But I have to tell you that I'm having second thoughts here. I'm really struggling. And he said, what is wrong? I said, it's your past. I said, you know, I, I, I just can't believe that God would not have had someone for me that wasn't like me, somebody that had a past. And he looked at me, and I will never forget the hurt look in his eyes. And he looked at me and he said, and I've never forgotten this, he said, don't you know that wasn't me? He said, that was the old man, Tracy. That was the old David Freck. He said, I'm a new creation sitting in front of you. 
But you see, up to this point, I was like one of the Pharisees. I believed that because I'd done everything according to the book that I was superior to him. You know, I had very little tolerance for outward sin at that point in my life. Do you remember the story in the Bible of how they brought the, the prostitute to Jesus, the Pharisees, and they wanted to stone her? I would have been one of those Pharisees. I would have had one of those stones in my hand ready to stone that girl because she had not lived the way that I felt she should have lived. And that's the way that I was. I would have been one of those people in the crowd saying, go ahead, kill her, stone her. She's not worthy. I didn't realize the sin that was in my own heart, the judgmental, critical spirit that I had, the way that I viewed the sinner. But I'm telling you, after my husband spoke those words to me, I got a glimpse of the love of God and the mercy of God and the redemption of God like I'd never had before. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he became irresistible to me. And God became irresistible to me. I was introduced at that moment to the irresistible love of God that I had never experienced in my life because I had never had to be forgiven of all those things. But yet here I was, a sinful heart, and didn't even realize it. And when he spoke those things to me, it was like the lights came on. And it wasn't even him, it was God in him. God was speaking through him. He was pastoring me even then, let me tell you. And it was the God in him that I fell in love with irresistibly that day. And since that day, I have found the love of God and the love of my husband to be completely irresistible in my life. And I've never turned back. I've never turned back from that irresistible love of God. I've never turned back from the irresistible love of my husband. I want to read um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to you, and we're getting ready to close. For the love of Christ controls and compels us because we have concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. His love controls me and compels me day after day now. I continue to find him irresistible as he continues to love me through my faults and my failures and those attitudes that I get, you know, as he continues to chase after me when I get off track and redeem me from my sinful nature every day. It's a process because every day you have those feelings, those thoughts that come up, those, those things that want to defeat your soul. And he comes in and he defeats the enemy of your soul with his irresistible love. You know, he gave us another great example. I'm hurrying of his love, and it's the story of the prodigal son found in Luke 15, and it's the story of a father who has two sons, and the youngest son, he decides that he's bored with the father's good life, and he wants to go out and do his own thing, so he asks for his inheritance. Everybody's familiar with it. He goes out, and he spends it, spends it all lavishly, ends up living in a horrible way, having parties and doing the things that he wants to do. And after he's spent all of his money and the world's taken all of his resource and, and leaves him with nothing, and that's what the world does, he decides to go home. And look at this scripture. It says, I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Filled with love and compassion, he didn't look at him and see his sin. He didn't look and see, oh, he's filthy, oh, he's dirty, like the Pharisees would have done. But the word says that he was filled with love and he was filled with compassion at the place where he was. And let me tell you something that the Father is just waiting for you this morning. If you're here and you don't know the Lord and you say, I've done too much, I can't be forgiven, the Father is just waiting for you. He wants to show you his irresistible love this morning. He wants to make you brand new. <laughs> He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with the feast, for the son of mine was dead and is now returned to life. 
He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. God always has the last word. God always has the last word. Can you stand with me this morning? Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like Gomer. Maybe you just feel like you've just done too many things and, and, and you, just, uh, you just need the Lord. Well, I just want to tell you that the Lord is here with forgiveness this morning. And we're getting, we're getting ready to start Church Interactive. Our prayer teams are coming. We're going to be serving communion. You can bring your offering to the Lord. But if you're here this morning and you want to know the Lord, please come to anybody who's standing up here. We will pray with you. We will lead you to the Lord. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like one of those Pharisees and you've identified yourself with the way that I was and you've been critical and you've been judgmental to the sinner. And maybe you want God to change your heart and give you a love for the sinner and for the outcast this morning. As we begin Church Interactive, just come. Let us pray with you. Let God do a work in your life. Maybe you've never ever experienced that irresistible love. Today it's here for you. All you have to do is come.